Hey everybody, it's FLF back for another Light Up Babylon. Before we dive in, be sure to hit the thumbs up to help support the channel. This will help it boost the YouTube algorithm. So I'll give you a second just to go ahead and tap that. Thank you so much. And if you're not subscribed already, hit the subscribe button and the bell for notifications to get notified when new videos get uploaded. So today we're gonna dive into something that's obviously been a very hot topic recently, and that's gonna be Roe v. Wade. Now Roe v. Wade and the overturning of it has been a very controversial thing you know, in the world in general, but uniquely in the Christian community as well. I'm noticing a lot of dialogue happening around it, and I felt it was important to kind of address it and look at it and talk about this issue and see what we can learn about the issue itself and how do we approach people and share a biblical, gospel-centric view of how to have that conversation. So naturally, as with any of these things, one of the things that kind of comes up is, uh, you know, politics can get very heated and you have two sides on the political issue or spectrum all the time. You have your conservatives and you have your progressives or, you know, your right wingers, your left wingers, and one will throw disparaging remarks at the other and vice versa. But what is unique about this Roe v. Wade being overturned and, and kind of everything that's transpired is that really, I think uh, a lot of the fogginess that kind of exists in Christianity to an extent gets cleared up. What I mean by that is that, you know, you have a lot of people who are wearing the title Christian, proclaiming to be Christian, maybe even doing the work of God, but at the end of the day, when controversial issues come to the forefront or issues that maybe have a particular hold on somebody um, come to the forefront and get discussed, there's that pivot where you say, I'm going to go with what the Bible says, or I'm going to embrace a worldview that does not align with scripture. Unfortunately, in this case, um, we have seen a lot of Christians kind of come out and show support or speak some sort of, um, I guess, lukewarmness about the issue of Roe v. Wade overturning. Now, if you're not a Christian and if you're not a believer, then by no means do I think um, the points that I'm gonna make are gonna hold a lot of weight. I think some of them might, but for the most part, the fact is when you have an encounter with Christ and you come to genuinely know Jesus, the perspective and your worldview changes so dramatically that it's hard to see things the exact same. It's like putting on a set of glasses or you know, seeing the color blue for the first time. You can never unsee it and you can never walk away from that experience unchanged when you encounter him. So why am I making this video? I think it's probably a great question. Well, I'm making this video specifically to address the Christians who are in support of a pro-choice position or kind of think about um, you know, abortion as being something that, hey, not for me, but if you wanna have it, I'm not gonna infringe on your rights. And that's kind of what I wanted to address in this particular video and kind of look at some of the evidence that we have, some of the scripture that we could reference and really dissect it. If you're already a pro-life person or someone that believes all human life is valuable, I encourage you to still watch this video to kind of get maybe more context or more resources available to you when you discuss this with a friend. I think um, oftentimes those conversations can be a little bit uncomfortable. And if you wanna broach the topic or the subject, this is gonna give you some great tools and munition to kind of approach that conversation with. One thing I do wanna be super clear about is that whenever we have these conversations, we should always approach it in love. We should always approach it in kindness. So as we dive into this, the first thing I really wanna lay the foundation of is what does the Bible say about human life? Now there's two scriptures in particular that I wanna list um, and I'll provide those on the screen right now, but Psalm 139 is a very important one because it really defines you know, the, the basis or the foundation of what God does when he creates life. So Psalm 139 verses 13 through 18. For you formed my inwards parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and my soul knows it well. My, my frame was hidden from you when I was made in secret and you skillfully wrought me in the lowest parts of the earth. Powerful stuff here and I, I think it's really powerful that this particular scripture talks about being formed in the womb and then also before my frame existed, you knew me. Before I came into existence, you knew me, which is a definitive point because it clearly identifies that every child before they were even formed in the womb was known by God. So every life has value just distinctly from that, that, that God knows that life that was about to come into existence before it was taken away. Another powerful scripture that I'm sure a lot of people are sharing right now is Jeremiah 1.5, where again, we get a picture into the creation and the value of life. Jeremiah 1 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. This is really powerful as well because it says before I formed you. So before you were conceived, before you came into existence, 
I knew you in the womb. And it goes on to say before you were even born. So while you're in the womb, you were sanctified. I, I wonder how Christians would perceive these arguments of pro-choice or how to approach these conversations if we thought of that, that every life was known before it came into existence by God. Every person rather was known by name before they were coming into existence and that that life in the womb was sanctified by God. Oftentimes, um, you know, we, we treat holy things as unholy or we treat the sanctified as unsanctified. How different would we view this issue if we remembered that every single life in the womb has been sanctified by God? Now, to make a transition here, I think it's important that we look at another piece of this equation, which is how does God view things like child sacrifice? Now, you know, I want to approach this gingerly, but in the old days, in Bible times, and you know, across the world, even outside of what's written in the Bible, we know that child sacrifice was a thing. This is not unknown, it's not uncommon, but it absolutely is something that we would find detestable, a child being born and we sacrifice them. Now, the interesting part is that these children were sacrificed to idols. In particular, we're gonna look at a few examples in the Bible, but children today are still being sacrificed to idols, just different types of idols. And what do I mean by that? Children today are being sacrificed for the idols of career, for the idols of self, for the idols of romance, for the idols of pride. All of these things that we might not depict as physical idols are definitely idols in the heart. And before we can advance, we need to tear down those idols. Child sacrifice is still a thing. It's happening across the country with millions of children dying every year. But the idols that we're worshiping and the idols that we're sacrificing to are much more deeper and profound. I saw this comic one time, and if I can find it, I'll put it on the screen, where there was a famous actress, I forget her name, but she had won an Oscar or uh, something to that effect, I believe. And she went up on stage and said, if I can't, you know, if I didn't have my abortion, I wouldn't be able to achieve this. And this comic, um, this four panel comic, showed the Oscar looking down at her, surrounded in fire, and this woman kneeling and offering up her baby to the Oscar. And I thought that was a very profound, very impactful image to say that we have essentially, or in this case, she had essentially offered her child up for the sake of this award of this golden statue. Very profound imagery and a good reminder of what we're encountering, what we're facing today. So with that being said, how does the Bible talk about child sacrifice? If we go to Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, we get a first glimpse of it here. And um, we will look at several other scriptures as well. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire or who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer or interprets omens or a sorcerer. And it goes on to, to list out all these other things associated with witchcraft. But it's interesting that it starts that verse by saying, none of you will make your son or your daughter pass through the fire. And that was a common practice, again, to pass a child through a fire from the pagan nations, from, the, from those nations that um, Israel was sent out to conquer and to destroy. We often hear this argument that God is a God of bloodshed, and the fact that he instructed the nation of Israel to utterly destroy these kingdoms is a terrible thing. But I think if we were to consider the United States versus Nazi Germany at the time, we wouldn't view that as um, a bad thing that the Nazis were ended or their regime was destroyed. Instead, we would kind of reframe our mind to say, okay, Nazi Germany, they're very wicked, but how much more wicked is the nation that's sacrificing every single one of their firstborn children to false idols by making them pass through the fire? Deuteronomy 18 addresses this, and it's a very serious thing, and God takes it very seriously. If we go to Ezekiel 16, on verse 21 in particular, we see God speaking to his people who have become an apostate nation. They've turned from God, and the prophet Ezekiel is documenting this process. One of the things that he says is that, you have slaughtered my children and sacrificed them to idols. Now, obviously, this is happening, um, you know, very far down the line after David. But imagine David, this, the book of Psalms, he's writing that before you were formed in the womb, I knew you and placing an incredible value on their life. Even before that, in Deuteronomy, Moses is writing down that you will not practice these things. And then you have a nation entirely practicing them 100%. This is a, a very powerful thing because it's pointing out that the nation of Israel was practicing this at some point and engaging in a behavior that God did not want them to engage in. If we look at 2 Kings 17 and 17, we're reminded again of Deuteronomy 18, where it goes on to say, And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. 
again, this apostate nation, this nation that has turned from God, their king and their people have turned from God. And what are they doing as a result of turning from God? Practicing the pagan rituals and committing the same sins that God instructed them not to do in Deuteronomy. In Leviticus 18, I'm jumping a little bit back here. I um, uh, just had it laid out in a, in, a, in a way that I wanted to explain it. But in particular, a God named Molech is called out in Leviticus 18. And thou shalt not give any of thy seed and make them pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am Jehovah. Powerful stuff here because again, we're being instructed very specifically not only to not do this action, which was um, uh, communicated in Deuteronomy, but specifically not to do it to this God Molech, right? Which is a, a unique call out and kind of gives some context to what was happening around Israel at that time and what these other pagan nations were doing. Is it possible that the United States usually originally founded as a Christian nation with all of its bumps and its warts and its problematic history has now turned into a fully apostate nation where child sacrifice has become the norm and we treat it like it's nothing because the idols are idols that we don't see. I think it's very possible and I think it's the case that we're witnessing right now. The last verse I want to end this on is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. And specifically, I want to kind of address what the end times will look like, right? Um, in this particular letter, we see how uh, the end of the earth uh, or the end of the earth before Jesus returns will look. So let's check this out. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, having nothing to do with, have nothing to do with such people. So again, what are we sacrificing these children to? What idols? The idols of career, the idols of self, the idols of money, the idols of pride. All of these things that we are seeing right here and that will happen in the last days are happening right now. And this idea that we're going to have a form of godliness but lacking the power thereof, more than ever, religions are cropping up everywhere. Witchcraft has become on the rise. Um, hedonism has become on the rise. You have atheists and agnostics. While they might be in a, a camp of lacking belief in God, are starting to believe in aliens, right? So you see this kind of trend that's shifting as the as we near the end of time before Jesus's return. That this exact um, thing that that we're seeing here in 2 Timothy is coming to fruition right now. Now, as we kind of pivot away from looking at these scriptures, I wanna kind of take this and contextualize it in real time with what we've seen so far in our nation when it comes to things like abortion. The first thing I wanna address is how abortion affects all communities and all people, but particularly the black community. When you have these politicians like Maxine Waters coming out and saying, you know, black women are most affected by the lack of abortion access, she is not lying, she is saying something very accurate. And let's look at these numbers here. In 2019, for reported legal abortions by a race of women that occurred in the United States, 38% of them were completed by black women. Now this should be an obviously alarming statistic because 38% of all abortions that were completed were done by a very small segment of the population. Black women make up a small minority of the entire population of the United States, but are committing more than a third of the total abortions. So why does this matter? The reason that I bring it up is because in particular, you have the United States with a history of eugenics ideas and eugenics attitudes towards black people and towards minorities across the board. The idea that we need to eliminate the weaker and the lower races so we can have a pure bloodline. This is no different than what Nazi Germany was trying to do with the Jews. We're seeing the exact same thing in the United States. And the proof that we have of that is that one of the founders of the most prolific abortion providers in the United States, Planned Parenthood, was Margaret Sanger. And her beliefs and her views were purely in line with some of the most racist ideologues that you could possibly imagine. Instead of trying to explain it and give a whole history and background, because that could take a lot of time, let me just read you some of the quotes that Margaret Sanger herself has penned. And I've actually linked down below in the description uh, a document called A Plan for Peace, which she penned. And you can access that PDF and read it for yourself so that you know none of this is being taken out of context. This is actually, many of the quotes that she wrote here are in A Plan for Peace and other publications. So let's look at those. One thing that Margaret Sanger wanted to do in particular was eliminate what she called lesser humans, 
right? So let's look at this quote right here that she wrote to a letter to Dr. C.G. Gamble in December 10th, 1939. We do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their rebe rebellious members. Very kind of an interesting thought there and especially when you see someone uh, like Martin Luther King, you know, who's a prolific activist, uh, one of the most pivotal uh, leaders of our generation, parroting some of the, the words that Margaret Sanger has said, it makes you wonder, was he unaware of this kind of racist undertone that Margaret Sanger had? The idea that we don't want word to get out that we want to exterminate them. Some people will say you could speculate to what that means, but let's look at some of these other quotes and see if it's really speculation or if we could safely assume that this was a very racist woman. In the magazine, Birth Control and Women's Health, Sanger writes, in the early years of race, the weak died early or were killed. Today, however, civilization has brought sympathy, pity, tenderness, and other lofty and worthy sentiments which interfere with the law of natural selection. We are now in a state where our charities, our compensation, acts, pensions, hospitals, and even our drainage and sanitary equipment all tend to keep alive the sickly and the weak who are allowed to propagate and in turn produce a race of degenerates. Now, I don't really know how to respond to that aside from, wow, very wicked, right? Like this idea that we have become too compassionate. Pre before natural selection would take away these kind of people, they would just be eliminated. Um, and she's saying here that we are wasting too much resources keeping these people alive. This is a common thing that's actually happening in Iceland where almost 100% of genetic tests that come back for a baby with Down syndrome are aborted, nearly 100% of those babies. So any, when a woman gets pregnant, she takes a genetic test. If it comes back that the baby has Down syndrome, there's a 99% chance that in Iceland, that baby would be aborted 100%. Now, if that doesn't make you kind of, you know, raise your eyebrows a little bit, it is kind of a concern, right? Where we can now do selective abortions, potentially based on the genetic defects of the child that we're about to have. We could say, okay, I want this one, I don't want this one. And even if you take that a step further, many states allow for selective abortions based on sex as well, where you could choose if you want a boy or a girl, vice versa. So this idea that we want to eliminate this lesser race or these lesser humans is not something that's isolated just to Margaret Sanger's thinking back in 1939, but it's propagated onwards. And here's a detail if you didn't pick it up. Who in her mind is a lesser person or a lesser human? Do you think she's talking about white people in this case? I doubt that heavily. When describing the root of societal problems, Here's what Margaret Sanger had to say. Women's instincts are fundamentally creative, not destructive, but her sex bondage has made her the dumb instrument of the monster she detests. For centuries, she has populated the earth in ignorance and without restraint, in vast numbers with staggering rap rapidity. She has become the mother of a she has become the mother not of a nobler race, but of a breeding machine grinding out a humanity which fills insane asylums, sweatshops, and provides cannon fodder that tyrants may rise to power on the sacrifice of her offspring. Now you see this same kind of point recently echoed in a very disturbing way. There was this clip I saw on Twitter and I really couldn't believe what I saw or what that Chiron across the bottom was saying, but it literally says, the abortion ban will increase mass incarceration, says this activist. This is on MSNBC. This is a black, I believe trans woman speaking on this. And what, what they go on to say is essentially, if we don't have abortions, these children are gonna go to foster homes, adoption agencies, be caught in the system, and then go to jail, right? So like what a, uh, Margaret Sanger couldn't have written the words better, you know, to, to kind of point out or make her point. The weak, the degenerate, the the in the inhuman, the lesser human, kill them off. It's better that they weren't alive because they're obviously just going to be problems for us in society. What's interesting about this video, though, is this person goes on to say that I was in the foster care and I was able to get out and, and you know get out and get an education and escape the prison system, but for the most part, no one else could really do that, right? Th this abortion ban is gonna to lead to mass incarceration. And the saddest part is again, black women are making up 38% of the total abortions in 2019 while making up a much smaller segment of the population. So the mindset is twisted here, it's sad, it's, it's kind of painful to see, and it's wild that a racist eugenicist from 1939 can still impact the way that we're thinking and behaving today. The last couple of points that I wanna make is that when you see something like this happen, you usually have a response from corporate America. Corporate America, they wanna be on the side of where the money is. That's why when June comes and Pride Month hits, 
you know, everyone is getting on board except for the countries that are not <laughs> that receptive to Pride Month. You'll see their logos change across the board, but when it comes to the Middle East or China, their logos are not changing to support rainbow, rainbow flags, right? So they're not as uh, uh, moral or ethical as they'd like to believe. But one of the things to point out here is that many companies were saying, you know, we'll step up, we'll step up to the bar. We will help pay for your transportation if you wanna go across state lines to get an abortion in a state that allows abortion like California or Colorado. And that is an interesting, a very interesting thought because the first thing that came to mind for me is if you really supported women's rights, why not give everyone a really great maternity leave? Great paid maternity leave as long as they need to. In some states, in some, in some countries, maternity leave going for as long as a year, why not offer that to them instead? And the reason, because an abortion is cheaper than one of your employees having a baby and being out of the office for six months. The fact is there. These companies don't care about you, they care about their bottom line. And this is one more way that they could kind of tip their hat as a virtue signal to make sure that, you know, th their pockets stay fat. If you were to come down with cancer or if you were to contract some sort of disease or if you were to get your legs blown off or be in a horrendous car accident, these companies are not stepping up saying they're gonna cover your medical bills in that case. But right now, you know, we can afford 500 bucks to let you get an abortion so you can be back to work on Monday. It's really disappointing to, to witness. And again, I don't think anyone should be applauding these companies or celebrating them for doing the one thing that's gonna save them money and pad their pockets. When we think about these issues, they could be challenging issues, they could be tough. They could be conversations that are uncomfortable to have. But at the end of time, before Jesus comes back and we look at a life, our life, and we catalog it and we see the decisions that we made, we're gonna be disappointed by a number of them. I know I have more decisions to be uh, disappointed and upset about than probably the normal person. But the one thing I don't wanna have is that I was an advocate for abortion or being a cho uh, having a, cho a pro-choice position as a Christian. I think as a Christian, we need to remind ourselves that all human life is valuable and that God, even before he allowed that conception to take place, knew who that person was. He formed them when they didn't have a frame. He sanctified them in the womb. All of these scriptures and what we've seen pointed to over and over again is the incredible value and sanctity that God puts on human life. So why would we not do the same and advocate for the same? I truly think it's an opportunity for us as Christians as well to step up to the plate even more with our time, with our money, and with our families. Whether you're thinking about adopting, donating money, or finding some way to support your community in a meaningful way, and those mothers who might be experiencing hardship, now is the time to do so. And there's lots of ways that you could do it. There's plenty of opportunities to do it. In California, there's something called Birth Choice, which actually is a nonprofit that helps women navigate having a baby despite limited resources. It's worthwhile pointing out that even back then, in 1999 or whenever Planned Parenthood got started, that they really did not provide any sort of resources for people to actually uh, continue their pregnancy. It was all about abortions, it was all about the money. So there's opportunities for us to help, and now is the time more than ever to step up. Thank you so much for watching this entire video. I appreciate your time. Again, it's FLF, and let's continue to light up Babylon and spread the gospel and the good news. God bless.